spent most of his naval career at sea. I cannot tell you how wonderful it is, again, to get back on rolling, pitching steel decks. I envy your last six or eight or 10 or 45 weeks, however long it's been. I trade places with any one of you for a bologna sandwich. Okay, quick word on who am I and why am I here. I'm Commander Mike West, U.S. Navy, retired. I call myself the ship guy just for fun because I love ships so much. I'm a third generation naval officer. My dad was a career naval aviator. He himself commanded two ships, one of which was a carrier. My granddad was Navy captain. Lots of years at sea duty in the Navy, you tend to go sea, shore, sea, shore. Whenever the Navy said, Mike, you want to go ashore, I'd say, nope, let's stay at sea. Lots of sea duty. Wouldn't you trade it? Taught for several years at the Naval Academy. Any Naval Academy types here? Tough day against Army uh, the other day. We'll, we'll get them next year. I was both the Chang. The Navy loves acronyms. Chang stands for Chief Engineer. I was both the Chang and skipper of two different Navy ships. And I just love all things nautical. Big history buff. But here's one of my most important messages for you today. Anywhere, anytime on the ship, you see me, you want to trade sea stories, flag me down. My wife isn't with me. She's heard me talk for 52 years. She said she has checked that box. So come on down any, anytime. Do you know the difference between a fairy tale and a sea story? Fairy tale starts out once upon a time. And a sea story starts out, listen up, knuckleheads, this is no, <laughs> you know the word, you know where it goes from here. But seriously, anywhere, anytime, I've already met a Navy fighter pilot, Navy master chief, airplane mechanic, and the one day I've been here, wonderful conversations. What's on the docket for our time together? Today we talk about the Spanish Armada. Upcoming, tomorrow we talk about HMS Victory. Lord Nelson's flagship at the Battle of Trafalgar. And the reason I, I just made this presentation up a couple weeks ago, and the reason I did is I kept reading where Victory and ships like her at the time were the most complex things ever made by man to that day. So I started pulling the string, and I think you'll find it interesting what that ship was all about and ships like her. Sink the Bismarck, you gotta sink a German battleship once in a while. Queens of the Seas, a look at the great ocean liners of history and how the ocean liners developed over time. One of my most popular is shipwrecks in time, believe it or not. Take a look at some of the famous shipwrecks and we take a look at why so many, literally hundreds of thousands of people died because they did not know what time it was. <laughs> Don't understand the connection? Come to the lecture and we'll figure it out. The great ships of history, what were some of the great ships in history? Why they were famous? Why were they important? And I end up with one that I, it's kind of whimsical, it's called Funnels, Flags, and Funny Paint. Talks about funnels, flags, and funny paint, and uh, some of the camouflage schemes and what we did to ships in times of war. But starting out here, I want to recognize a very special lady, the mighty Z-Boat. I love these little ships. I, I say little, I mean everything's relative. But I would stay here for the rest of my life if I could. My own career, I started off on a guided missile destroyer, the Cochrane, out of Pearl Harbor. Uh, we were there the day Saigon fell. Uh, that was my second Southeast Asia deployment. Another picture of the same class of ship. I only added this because I think it's such a wonderful picture of one of the prettiest ship types that ever went to sea. I was the weapons officer on the good ship John Paul Jones. We had a five inch, is this showing? Yeah. We had a five inch gun on the Vauxhall. We had torpedo tubes for submarines. We had a nuclear capable anti-submarine rocket and we had surface to air missiles. Neat little ship, lots of capability. We were out in the Persian Gulf when the Iranian hostage crisis unfolded back in the day. I was then chief engineer on a large amphibious transport. Pretty sure this is where my heart problems started. 
lots of moving parts, literally and figuratively. A lot of ship to take care of. Then the Navy said, okay, Mike, we're going to make you the executive officer, second in command of an anti-submarine warfare frigate, good ship Whipple, out of Pearl Harbor. And a few years later, they gave me my own command, USS Miller, named for the man that Cuba Gooding Jr. played, Doris Miller, in the movie Pearl Harbor. He was a uh, cook, went up to the bridge of the USS West Virginia during Pearl Harbor, and engaged the enemy with great uh, effectiveness. Later lost in the war, but as we speak, the Navy's latest humongous nuclear carrier is going to be the Miller name for the same fellow. Okay, let's take a look. In July and August of 1588, England's Navy fought and won one of the most important naval battles in history. And when I say battles, maybe I should use the word campaign, because most of us grew up, I think, watching Errol Flynn movies, where these ships fight these ships, boom, 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 boom. Two hours later, Errol swings across, kills the other skipper, everybody's happy, and he and Olivia de Havilland sail off into the sunset, ever happy. The engagement with the Spanish Armada was not a battle of an afternoon, or two or ten. It was more a campaign over months, actually months, and we'll take a look at this and how it unfolded. The historical context of the time, there had been Anglo-Spanish tensions for years. King Philip II of Spain really wanted to invade England. He really was getting tired of good Queen Bess and everything that she was doing to him, which we'll look at in a second. And he wanted to restore Catholicism to the British Isles. He wanted to pay her back for her supporting the Dutch revolt. And I think most importantly, he really wanted to stop the British privateers from raiding all that golden loot that was coming back to Spain from all of Spain's far-flung colonies. The two bosses, a heads of state at the time, Queen Elizabeth I. The more I read about this woman, the more in awe I am of her. She really was something. A backbone of steel, knew what she wanted, and she was one of the first great spy masters in history. She had agents all over Europe feeding her information, and she was probably the best informed monarch to her time. King Philip II of Spain, after, from what I've read, also a good human being and a pretty good king. But they just didn't see eye to eye. So why was Phil gunning for baths again? Restore the faith. Lots of treasure being lost to British raiders. And stop the interference of the Brits in the Spanish Netherlands. Quick look at the Spanish Empire at the time. At the time, the British Empire didn't exist. We all grew up with the phrase, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Pretty much the same was true for the Spanish Empire at the time. There was no British Empire at this time. The Spaniards really were far and wide. You might be curious as to why or how the Spanish let this part of South America get away from them. Everything west is Spanish, but not what is essentially Brazil. And the story behind that was Portugal, at the time, Portugal and Spain were the two great seafaring, exploring nations. They were planting their own flags wherever they went. They started knocking heads on who gets what <coughs> territory. They couldn't work it out between themselves. They took it to the Pope in uh, 1494, I believe it was, and he, the Pope, issued what they called the Treaty of Tordesilla, which established a line of longitude, and the Pope said, everything east, Portugal, you get, everything west, Spain, you get, and that's why the map looks like it does. Fast forward a bunch of years, apparently the Pope never really said what happens at 180 degrees around it, there were lots of fights about that. But for the time being, that's how they resolved it. Tremendous influx of treasure and booty to the Spanish Empire. And where there are treasure ships, there are people that want to take it away from you. 
British privateers ravaged the Spanish tra treasure fleets. Sir Francis Drake was probably the most famous and most accomplished, a very respected and very capable mariner and a very good naval fighter. Just for fun, what is a privateer? They are folks who actually have charters from their own crowns to say, go out, capture the other guy's ship, bring back the booty, and we'll split it in accordance with whatever deal we strike today. So in a sense, it was legitimized piracy. But it was a way for the crowns to keep the, the loot coming in. In 1588, Philip decided to act. He assembled a fleet of 130 ships they called the Grande y Felicimas Armada, the great and most fortunate navy, eh, for a while, and the British called, called it the Spanish Armada. Okay, here we go, all aboard for sunny England. The Armada departed Lisbon in May of 1588. It took them two full days to get the fleet underway. Ships moved slowly in those days. They probably were sailing at four, maybe six knots. Big, fast, ponderous, hard to maneuver ships. Two days to depart Lisbon, late May. Their purpose, to escort a convoy of troop ships that had about 8,000 soldiers on them from Lisbon up to Flanders near the Pas de Calais in France load 30,000 more soldiers in barges, take them across the English Channel, up the Thames Estuary, land them in London, conquer London, conquer England. They were there to invade England. Who were the commanders of the fleets? Initially, the Armada was commanded by a fellow named Alvaro de Bazan, first Marquess of Santa Cruz, he was really something. He was a career naval officer. Check this out. He had never lost a battle wow. in 50 years. He was all W's, no L's. This is the guy I want on my team. He was an early advocate of what was to become the Armada. About five years early, he started advocating for this. And then he dies just a few months before the Armada set sail. He was appointed the boss and then died just a few months before. What a shame. Okay, so what's King Philip II do next? Well, he needs a replacement, and he singles out a fellow named the Duke of Medina Sidonia, who, drum roll, no naval expertise or experience, but was a competent administrator, had social standing, important in Spain, was modest, tactful, and quote, a good Catholic. He knew himself <laughs> he wasn't the right guy for this. He wrote the king and said, boss, this is not a good idea. I'm not the guy. Good King Philip said, yes, you are. Execute your orders. Gulp, yes, sir. His efforts to get out of this were unsuccessful. Maybe he was pressing it. Maybe he kind of knew down deep what was coming. But he was a good organizer. He reorganized the Armada. He increased the ammunition load for each ship. He birthed, he allowed his people to be birthed ashore. You may recall in those days, sailors were really nothing short of prisoners on their ship because if they were let ashore, life was so harsh on the ships, they'd all beat feet into the hills. The Brits certainly didn't let their sailors go ashore in any great number, but this fellow did to try to humanize the experience. And he, in general, was reportedly reported to have gained the trust of his subordinates. So, good fellow, good heart, just not much experience in things naval. Not a good fleet commander, was reported to be timid, had little initiative, low self-confidence, relied too heavily on others, and himself at the time was not in great health. Well, I guess you can't have it all. <laughs> Across the pond was Charles Howard, Earl of Nottingham. He was the English guy in charge. 
He was also not a professional mariner, but very much what we call, being a Washington, D.C. guy, a Beltway insider. He knew everyone. He would had every job close to the crown. People knew him, trusted him. Pretty smart guy. He was picked to be the number one guy in the Royal Navy. Named Lord High Admiral in 1585. And as we'll see, pretty smart guy. In the years prior to the engagement, a fellow named Sir John Hawkins set out to modernize the British Navy. He created a larger number of smaller, more nimble ships. He got better guns and better ammunition for the Royal Navy. And he insisted on training, training, training to get the sailors to where they could fight properly and well. As anyone who's ever been to sea, I think, will agree, the best thing a skipper can have on his ship is a well-trained crew. The Brits took this to heart. The Spanish plan. Okay, listen, this is interesting. Sail to the Netherlands. Great big armada, 2,000 sailors, 8,000 soldiers. We're going to meet up with uh, the Duke of Parma in Flanders, pick up his 30,000 troops, horses, wagons, hay, wine, and whatever it is that 30,000 soldiers bring along with them, they're going to sail up the Thames, take London, and take England. Mm -hmm. King Philip had told the boss, Sidonia, do not engage the British unless you have to. And if you have to, make sure it's an in-close engagement because your massive increase in numbers or numerical advantage will allow you to carry the day in any fight, essentially a soldier against soldier, because the Brits didn't have a lot of people on each ship. The Spanish did, so don't engage the Brits unless you have to, but if you do, get in close and duke it out with them. So with a plan like this, you got to ask, what can go wrong? Okay, what brought you to the fight? On the Spanish side of the ledger, 130 ships, 8,000 sailors, 18,000 soldiers. As it turns out, the soldiers were the gunners on the ships, and we'll hear more about that later. 2,500 guns amongst them, and they were going to go meet 30,000 of their buddies up in the Netherlands. For the British side, they had 227 ships of all types. Ships were faster, more maneuverable, more nimble. Guns had longer range, very important, but sadly, and to the British disadvantage, they were not as well supplied as the Spanish. Quick look at the Spanish ships, the galleon, they were really large, slow, and cumbersome. To maneuver in a great big fat sailing ship took a lot of people and a lot of time. Nothing happened quickly on these ships. Just as an aside, the Spanish, the word galleon comes from the old French, galleon, armed, ship of burden, and similarly, the Castilian word galleon for armed merchant ship, synonym for the same thing. They were armed cargo carriers, many of these were treasure ships, and these were the ships that were bringing back all the silver and gold from the New World. Some of these ships were as large as 2,000 tons. My destroyer weighed 4,000, so this thing was half as big as my destroyer. Big ships. Here's where they fell down from a maneuverability. Some of their beams were one-third their length. That's like this ship having a beam of 300 feet. You just can't maneuver fat ships very well. Ponderous, slow, not maneuverable, but they were heavily gunned. Speaking of guns, here's just a look at a typical cannon of the day, something called a demi cannon. Had a six inch bore, 11 foot barrel, thing weighed over two and a half tons. Took 18 pounds of powder to shoot a 32 pound ball all of 1600 feet. Not a misprint, not yards, feet. Not very good. And it gets worse. For those of you who are familiar with guns and pistols, you know that the bullet fits very snugly in the barrel. These guns were all muzzle loaders. 
Well, you can't have a bullet or cannonball that fits really, really tightly in the board. You can't load it. You've got to have a lot of slack between the ball and the, the bore in order to roll it down there, tap it down, load it, and shoot it. So the typical arrangement was the cannonball was typically 10% smaller than the bore. So you're talking tremendous gap between the cannonball and the bore. And when the powder went boom, instead of going straight and true, the cannonball would boom, 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 down the barrel. And where it was headed when it came out the barrel was anybody's guess. And I guess that's one of the reasons why they had broadsides of 30, 40, 50 guns at a time. Because maybe some mathematical genius figured out that at the end of the day, all the errors would cancel out. And some bullet would hit somebody somewhere. But that was the problem. Tremendous gap between the ball and the bore. And just as an example, here's a modern day bullet. Very, very, very tight fit. A couple of words about the British ships. Okay, we've talked smaller and faster, better guns, better guns and gunners. One of the threads that you'll hear throughout today and tomorrow is the British sailor just was really good at what he did. You could flog him, you could starve him, you could kill him with scurvy, but when push came to shove and the battle flag went up, the British sailor always rose to the occasion and just gave his heart and soul to his skipper, his crown, and his navy. And that's something that comes through in everything I've read, is the English sailor was a remarkable man. They could fire two to three times as fast as the Spanish. Here was one of the ships that Hawkins was so famous for. He took a large number of British ships that had been built up very heavily. Lots of topside weight that helped make the ships unmaneuverable, less maneuverable. He cut down a lot of the upper works, made the ships smaller, lighter, faster, easier to fight. There were no, actually, as Hawkins ships. And they had longer range of guns, and they could get two to three times the number of rounds out per unit of time as the Spanish. Warfare under sail in general. Three critical constraints. Something we call the weather gauge, which we'll look at in a second. Few, if any, of these ships had forward-facing or aft-facing guns, so you couldn't shoot anyone ahead of you or astern of you. You had to be beside the, the target. And it was really hard to communicate. Once the firing started, trying to send a flag hoist to that ship a thousand yards over, turn left, do this, no, 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 it was just hard. Smoke, din, chaos, noise, confusion, as Van Clausewitz used to call it, the fog of war. The British, I'm sorry, the Spanish had yet another constraint that slowed them down. They had what essentially was what I call command by committee. <coughs> Instead of having a career naval officer and really experienced mariner as the skipper, they had an aristocrat who came from some well-known family placed in command, and working for him were his four primary assistants, sailing master, navigator, master gunner, captain of marines. So again, command by committee just doesn't work, folks. You've got to have someone in charge who's competent and can say, turn right, turn left, not, let's talk about it, what do you think? This thing we call the weather gauge. Here are two lines of ships. Let's say the wind is coming from the north. Sailing ships, even as big and as fat and as ponderous as they were, they could actually sail just a little bit into the wind. Not much, but they could sail a tiny bit into the wind. But if you had the weather gauge, that meant you were always upwind of your enemy, and you could choose when to engage, turn into him, boom, 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 or not to. The British always, always strove to get and maintain the weather gauge. Interestingly, it was actual French doctrine to be on the downwind side of the battle, so they could disengage it well. <laughs> It's a mindset. It's a mindset, folks. Uh, but that's the weather gauge. You hear this a lot, and it's really important. 
another doctrine. The British, or the, the ships of the day, actually would try to time their firing to shoot on either the uproll or the downroll. Because where you were in space determined which way your guns were pointed, which determined where your cannonballs went. The British doctrine was shoot on the downroll because we want to put hole, holes in their hulls. Sink the other guy. French and Spanish said, no, he's did. We we're going to go shoot high to kill all the men up in the rigging, shoot away your mast, and once your masts have come down, you will be helpless. We will come alongside, put grappling hooks over, board you, and kill you. Well, history shows the Brits had the better idea. Poking holes in the other guy's ship is better than poking holes in his sails. That's all there is to it. As my submarine skipper used to say, you don't want water in the people tank. <laughs> Another tactor, tactic, doubling. Red line of ships alongside the blue line. Red turns to starboard, breaks through the blue line, and reverses course. And now you've got these ships being clobbered from both sides. These blue ships are out of the battle. They're worthless. So this is what we call doubling. And this is something that people really wanted to do. And as you crossed another ship's uh, bow, you could deliver what we call raking fire, which is sending cannonballs down the entire length of that ship instead of just putting a three-inch hole or six-inch hole through the ship. Why not wreak destruction the entire length of the ship? And that was really deadly. If you could put a broadside down the length of the ship's deck, you could really create some damage and kill a lot of people. And for those of you who saw Russell Crowe and Master and Commander, I'm reminded of this picture, and this is every naval officer's dream. Well, most of us. <laughs> I think most of those guys actually died from splinters and uh, fragments, uh, very serious. The morphine of a phrase or a term. The ships in a line of battle were ships in the line of battle. Ships were a ship with a line of battle. That morphed into a line of battle ship, which of course morphed into battleship. That's how we got the term battleship. Interestingly enough, history shows that when evenly matched forces fought, they actually tended to be draws. Most people came away with a draw with these big battles. Kind of an interesting observation. Well, let's take a look at the Spanish Armada. It was not a brief violent encounter like an Errol Flynn movie, but it slowly evolved actually over a couple of months. And here's the 20,000 foot view. The Spanish come up from Lisbon, work their way up the English Channel, the Brits are pecking away at them the whole way up the channel, and it all comes to a head here. But keep this in mind, if you would, as we just kind of work our way up the channel. And remember that this is the Isle of Wight, and we'll come back to that in a second. That's important. Okay, what happened? 30th of May, the Armada departs Lisbon. It takes them two days to clear the harbor. Elizabeth, with her spies, knew they were coming. Same day, the British put to sea with the intent of intercepting them in the Bay of Biscay. That went completely haywire. The Brits never found the Spanish, returned to Portsmouth. The 19th of July, so we're talking six, seven weeks later, seven weeks later, the Armada is sighted near Lizard, which is right here. One of the more famous stories on Sir Francis Drake. The story goes that he and his officers were doing a game of lawn bowls in Plymouth. And the messenger comes running up to report the sighting of the Armada coming up the channel. Spanish, millions of them, the Spanish is coming. And supposedly Drake said, oh, the wind is against us, tide's against us, can't leave harbor. Let's finish the game. And he and, he and his buddies finished the lawn bowl game. Then they went down to sea and went to work. On the 20th of July, the Brits depart Plymouth. 
21st of July, winds are from the west. And so it's easy to sail downwind, tough to sail upwind. But the Brits, when they left, I'm sorry, Plymouth, they split their forces. A smaller force turned right immediately and hugged the coast. A larger force kept going into the more open ocean and then turned right with their intent to get behind the Spanish Armada to maintain the weather gauge. Then on the 27th of July, the Armada anchors in Calais, and we'll get to that in a second. But the first battle off Plymouth, Plymouth is up here somewhere. Drake and a smaller force had turned right very quickly. The big boss turned right later, got behind the Spanish. That we're all going this way. The Spanish very consciously had a crescent-shaped formation where their fighting ships were in the wings and their supply ships and troop ships were in the middle where they could be protected. So here come the Brits. They're faster, more nimble ships. They're catching up. The, actually, the Spanish could have gone into Plymouth and raised Cain with the Brits, but remember, the orders were, don't engage the Brits unless you have to. That may have been a fatal mistake. He chose not to engage the British. So right about here, Drake says, let's try something new. He's the junior guy. He puts his ships in a line ahead, one after the other, and they sail up the starboard wing of the Spanish and now all of his port side guns can be brought to bear, where relatively few of the greater number of Spanish ships can be brought to bear. So they bang away at each other for the better part of the day. 2,000 cannonballs later, no Spanish ship was sunk, the British disengaged. During this battle, two Spanish ships collided and were out of action, Rosario and San Salvador. And the only reason I mention this is, we'll come back to this in a second. Seconds up. <laughs> that night, Howard gave Drake one thing to do. Frank, don't lose sight of the Spanish. That's all, you got one job, Frank. Keep a hold of the Spanish. Aye, aye, sir. So what does he do? Drake douses his stern light, runs over here, and plunders Rosario. I think the phrase, easily distracted by bright and shiny objects, come to mind. <laughs> a looter, a privateer by DNA, yeah, the boss told me to maintain contact with the Spanish and maybe prevent the fall of our country, our crown, our way of life, but, oh, look, there's a wreck over here. Let, let's, let's go raid the wreck. Takes his ships over, raids Rosario. The next morning, his squadron is completely scattered. The Spanish are gone. It takes him an entire day to catch up. Armada has continued eastward uncontested. But the, the Brits finally catch up. The next day, the Spanish are headed for the Isle of Wight, that big island I showed you earlier. Sidonia had a pretty serious problem in that he did not know if Parma the boss of the 30,000, was ready to go or not. He had dispatched numerous little messenger boats to, to find out, hey, are you ready to go? I'm going to be there on such and such a day. Are you ready to go? Tell me, yes or no. Parma never answered. So that begs the question, did they ever get the messages? We'll never know. But Sidonia did not know if Parma and his 30,000 were ready. The real problem being, by a quirk of geography, there were no good places for a ship to lie to east of the Isle of Wight on the south coast of England, but there was at the Isle of Wight and westward. So passing the Isle of Wight, Sidonia had an important decision. Do I press on, hoping they'll all be there, or do I heave to and figure this all out? Actually, they were going to take the Isle of Wight with their 30,000. <clears> So, big engagement, the British prevail. After a full day of battle, again, the winds from the west, they had been blown downwind to the east. They could not get back to the Isle of Wight 
nature had made the decision for them, there was no going back. They had to press on, no matter what. Was Parma with 30,000 people ready to go? Yeah, what are the chances of that? Okay, so now the Spanish keep sailing to the little town of Calais, which we've all heard of, and they anchor. And the Brits, on the evening of the August, August 7th, now remember, we're talking about late May, all of June, all of July. This is nine or ten weeks later into the campaign. The Brits take a bunch of their ships, load them with everything flammable, to include putting two cannonballs in every cannon, fill them, fill them with can, uh, powder, so that when they got hot and cooked off, they would just shoot in some given direction. They set these eight ships to fire. When the tide and wind were right, they released them to float down into the Spanish anchorage. The Spaniards really went nuts and panicked. Although none of their ships burned, none of their ships was sunk, they got underway in great disarray. They cut their anchor cables, pretty serious thing in a sailing ship, got underway, and one grounded. Remember that. Spanish fleet was in total disarray when the sun came up the next day. So Admiral Howard, the head guy, Drake's boss, is presented with a great opportunity, total disarray. His ships are there. Lord Howard was off looking at the Spanish grounded ship with his part of the squadron. Disarray and confusion persisted again for most of that day. And then uh, Spanish were still scattered. Then the Battle of Graveline eventually uh, transpired, which was the battle that lasted most of that next day. The poor Spanish gunnery crews, who actually were mostly the soldiers, and their very slow firing rate. British disengaged at about 4 p.m., almost out of ammo. The wind was blowing the Spanish directly towards the Dutch coast. And that part of the world, the water gets really shallow, and it's really tricky navigation there. And, but the Spanish knew this, and they had to do something not to blow ashore in the shallows. And then all of a sudden, the Spanish finally caught a break kind of, the wind shifted from the north to the west so the Spanish could sail to the east to get away from the, the Brits. Well, that's kind of, kind of good news because what the Spanish, of course, really wanted to do was get back to Lisbon, but they could not fight the strong westerly winds. So Sidonia said, gulp, we're going to sail all the way around Scotland and England and Ireland to get back to home. And they rounded the Orkneys and on the west coast of Ireland ran into some horrific weather. Several dozen ships were grounded, broken up, and most of the survivors that were able to drag themselves ashore in Ireland were killed with the exception of Brits being good businessmen. They discovered who the nobles were, held them for ransom, killed everybody else, and the nobles were in fact ransomed back to their families in Spain. But the, the, the Spanish <laughs> suffered horribly. Out of food, out of water. So now you're hungry and thirsty while you're getting your throat slit. The toll, 35 ships lost, about 20,000 dead. The British, very few ships lost, 600 combat deaths, 800 disease deaths. You might wonder, how in the world did that happen? And the answer is one of the most god-awful things I've ever read. When the Armada got back to port, having saved the nation and saved the crown, they were told by the crown, you go into Plymouth, anchor, and no one goes home. Well, what do you mean? We just saved the country. Shh. Anchor, nobody goes ashore. A year later, no more than half of the sailors who fought for the crown in this battle were alive. They had died of starvation and scurvy at the anchorage, with the real point being the crown figured, as I, as I kind of deduce, the more of these guys had died, the less they'd have to be paid. And it was that cynical. 
So roughly half the folks who had saved the country were dead a year later, and that's why these numbers are what they are. Some of the Spanish lessons learned was the plan too ambitious? Yeah, I think so. You don't want amateurs at the helm. You want that first guy who, who died. Too bad he didn't live. The importance of the weather gauge. The wisdom of engaging at range instead of close in. Don't let someone with a lot more soldiers than you come alongside. And just the advantage of good warfare, war fighting doctrine, which the British had. The British plan took way too long to execute. They had the better admiral initially until he died. Had they acted more quickly, the British would have been less prepared. As, we, as they teach us in the War College, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Some of the wisest words I've ever heard. What the British did right, they knew of the impending invasion. Elizabeth's spies saw this coming, they knew it was coming. The Brits took early action. The year before, in 1587, Drake raided Cadiz and raised holy hell with the Spanish fleet there and burned, whether it was the factory or a warehouse full of staves. Whoa, he said, what in the world's important about that? Well, in those days, everything, food, Water, dried pemmican, gunpowder, everything went to sea in barrels. And Sir Francis Drake burned up all the barrel parts, and so the, they couldn't make barrels. Well, they slowed them down a lot. The British built up their fleet. They knew something was coming. They built signal towers along their southern coast so they could communicate up and down the coast easily and effectively. History's results, this was certainly the high point of Queen Elizabeth I's reign. They confirmed Protestantism in England. The British Navy ruled the waves for hundreds of years later. And the British Navy made the British Empire possible. So here's where we start to see the genesis of the British Empire. But let's take a look and play some what if. What if the Spanish had in fact won the campaign? Queen Elizabeth certainly would have been captured, deposed, probably executed. Catholicism would have been reinstituted in England. No Protestants, no support for the Dutch. The Dutch Empire, all that Dutch East India Empire they had may not have happened. There would have been no subsequent British naval push to build up the British Empire. Spain would have become the next world superpower because there would have been no competition. And in my own estimation, humble as it is, of course, had there been no British Empire, there probably would have been no USA. I think that's very possible. So everything that you and I see, know, and do, I think could be traced back to the British having won this campaign. Folks, that's it for the... Spanish Armada, please, anywhere, anytime, talk about ships, come and join our club. And airplanes, if you want to talk about airplanes, anywhere, anytime. Thank you, folks. And tomorrow we talk about HMS Victory.